This video is an outreach of Unity Christian Church, 5255 South Linden Road, Swartz Creek, Michigan. I am Brenda Etheridge, pastor and teacher. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the mission of Unity Christian Church is to lead people to Jesus Christ and to encourage one another on our faith journey. Today's scripture is from Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, and then chapter 3, verse 22b through 28. And it reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. And there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes a boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works. No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one and he will justify the circumcised on the grounds of faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Thanks be unto God for the reading and the hearing of God's word. The title of this sermon is The Power of the Gospel. I've been a Bible student for most of my life and have read through the Bible on more than one occasion. I must admit that I've also been a pastor for over 10 years and have read or quoted from the book of Romans on numerous occasions in sermons and as comforting words as we celebrate the life of a blessed saint that has gone home to be with the Lord. So in this time of pandemic and isolation, I want us to take an opportunity to seriously look into the book of Romans. Therefore, for the next several weeks, we will examine Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome and eavesdrop to hear what God is saying to us. Today, we will do a survey or an overview of the book that has 16 chapters. The writer of this letter was the Apostle Paul. The letter contains a number of historical references that agree with known facts in Paul's life so that there is no dispute of Paul's authorship. The doctrinal context of the book is typical of Paul, which is evident from a comparison with the other letters that we are sure that he wrote. 
the book was probably written in the early spring of the year of our Lord, 57. Very likely Paul was on his third missionary journey, ready to return to Jerusalem for, with the offering from the mission churches for, for the poverty-stricken believers in Jerusalem. In chapter 15, it is suggested that Paul may have already received contributions from the churches in Macedonia and Acadia. So he was either in Corinth or had already been there. The most likely place for writing is either Corinth or Sincrea, which is only about five, uh, six miles away from Corinth. We find this from references to uh, Phoebe, who was from that city, and to Gaius, uh, Paul's host, who was probably a uh, Corinthian. Um, we also hear from Erastus, who was also from the Corinthian community. The original recipients of the letter were the people of the church at Rome, who were predominantly Gentiles. Jews, however, must have constituted a substantial minority in that congregation, as we see from references to that community within the letter. Perhaps Paul originally sent the entire letter to the Roman church, but afterwards he or someone else took small portions of the letter and distributed them to the church at large. Paul's purpose for writing this letter were varied. He wrote to prepare the way for his coming to a visit to Rome and his proposed mission trip to Spain. He also wrote to present the basic system of salvation to a church that had not received that teaching from any of the apostles before. Also, he sought to explain the relationship between the Jewish Christians and the Gentiles in God's overall plan of redemption. The Jewish Christians were being rejected by the larger Gentile group in the church because the Jewish believers still felt constrained to observe the dietary laws and sacred days. The book of Romans is the Apostle Paul's masterpiece. Paul's primary theme is the basic gospel. It was God's plan of salvation and righteousness for all humankind, Jews and Gentiles alike. Romans explains God's plan of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Divinely inspired, Paul passes on truths that are followed by believers to this very day. Paul says, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone, everyone who believes. Paul starts the letter of Romans by showing that we all need salvation. Everyone can know that there is an almighty God, but people were not honoring him, according to chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. In a clear and powerful way, Romans reminds us about God's greatness. Nobody Nobody can successfully oppose God, and nothing, nothing can prevent the power of God's love on behalf of God's people. The book of Romans is unique. As you know, most of the New Testament 
epistles are letters written to various churches, usually intended to address and correct some problem that has cropped up among the believers. But the book of Romans is an organized summary of the doctrine of salvation as seen throughout the Bible and as proclaimed in its fullness in the New Testament scriptures. The Apostle Paul begins our verses by staking a claim for the gospel, anxious to share it and proclaim it to others. As he describes it, the gospel is power, the power of God for salvation. Paul is speaking to a people who live in a culture in which military might is seen as a means of power. So he presents here a different kind of power, the power of God that opens the door of salvation, the divine spiritual power that works to save humanity from the bondage of sin the bondage of death, the bondage of the evil one as personified in Satan himself. Paul contrasts that power of God to other kinds of powers that gain a foothold in the world. Power acquired through possessions and wealth, military might, political position, corporate leadership, and the list goes on. This power is in contrast to the power with which Satan tried to tempt Jesus. You remember in that situation, the devil took Jesus on a, to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, promising to give all to Jesus if Jesus would just fall down and worship him. Jesus responds, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So here the apostle Paul contrasts the power of God with all worldly powers, no matter how great that worldly power perceives itself to be. Knowing this power for himself, Paul is not ashamed to proclaim its power of salvation. In our scripture, Paul introduces major themes that he will unpack in much greater detail later in this letter. That is, who, what, and how of this salvation. Salvation is available to everyone who has faith. And in this faith, the righteousness of God is revealed. You see, faith holds the key to salvation. It's not the law. It's not the works that people do. It is faith. This Romans passage serves as a great equalizer for those who think that they have greater access to God because of who they are or people who have the law or follow the commandments or because of the works that they do. In the earlier verses of chapter three, Paul argues, however, that there is not one single person who is righteous. All of humanity is accountable to God, whether under the law or not. While the law prescribes works of righteousness, the law serves to bring forth the knowledge of sin. With that is the recognition that no one is able perfectly to fulfill the works of the law. Paul makes the point that all Jews, those people who have been under the law all their lives, 
and all Greeks and Gentiles, those who have never been under the law, have all sinned and have all fallen short of the glory of God. What is glory? What is this glory of God, you ask? Well, according to Paul, it is the likeness of God within each of us. Each human's original estate as created in the likeness of God. If our true character is in the image and likeness of God, and we have sinned, then we have fallen short of our true spiritual nature. We have to date missed the mark of our true selves. We have yet to reach the fullness of who we are created to be and have veered away from our right relationship with our creator. You see, sin holds us back from our true spiritual selves. Sin holds us back from our relationship with God. Paul says none is righteous, but faith opens the door for salvation for any who will believe. The faith of which Paul speaks is a faith in God through Jesus Christ. God's work manifested in Jesus is redemptive and it brings us back to God. Even though we have veered off from God, even though we have fallen short, the work of Christ serves as a sacrifice of atonement. It removes the deserved punishment due for the sins that we have committed. And it results in reconciliation with God. So we are now justified. That means we are brought back into a right relationship with God. Our redemption and our justification become effective through our faith in God, through Christ Jesus, the one who was slain and yet was resurrected. There's another critical point that Paul wants to make perfectly clear. Everything that God has done for us in Christ is unearned and undeserved. Persons are not justified, are now justified by God's grace. Not because what we have done. It is God's free gift to humanity, free to all, but costly. It costly, cost dear to God and to Christ. When we think of this in terms of Paul's statement that it was because of God's forbearance, God's willingness to refrain from giving human beings what we deserve as sinful people, that God passed over sins previously committed. All of us can and should breathe a collective sigh of relief and lift up holy hands in thanksgiving and hallelujahs to the God of our salvation. The wages of sin is death. But the free and gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In our scripture, it is God who is righteous. It is God who has graciously acted on our behalf through Jesus Christ to give you and me an opening and access to God's own righteousness. It is God who moves beyond distinctions between Jews and Gentiles, black, brown, yellow and white, poor and rich, educated and uneducated, natural citizens and immigrants, and the list goes on. But it is God who makes 
plain that God is the God of us all. Our response is to have faith in God through Jesus Christ. And with this, the door of salvation is graciously opened. This, this, my brothers and sisters, is the power of the gospel. Thanks be unto God. Each of us must decide for ourselves whether we will accept the gospel. The good news of Jesus' offer of eternal life through a relationship with his Father, the creator of the universe. His invitation is to each of us to believe the good news of God's abounding love in Jesus Christ, to confess our belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, accept him, commit ourselves to him and to his ways through the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for showing us that we can have eternal life and a relationship with you. Thank you for the power of the gospel message. Thank you for allowing us to be your partners in mission and ministry. Thank you for equipping us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, you know that we currently find ourselves in a time of double uncertainty. On the one hand, many people are ill and there are those who doubt whether this is even real or some conspiracy to disturb our economy and make us fearful. But Lord, you know that others have lost loved ones and believe that it is real. But we know that we are brothers and sisters and we respect each other. We're also in the midst of social unrest and people cry out for justice especially those who feel that they have been denied justice and equal protection under the law of this country. Lord, give us discerning spirits. Help us to listen to one another, respect one another, and remember that underneath the skin of every human being is the same blood from which you made all humanity. Teach us to trust you in all things. Keep us vigilant and concerned about the health and well-being of all people. Lord, you know that we are anxious and fearful. Help us to depend on you more and more. Trust you more and more. Walk in your ways more and more. Lord, we pray for those who continue to have various illnesses. Lord, we ask for your protection of all, your guidance for all, your forgiveness for all your salvation for all. Replace our fear with faith and courage. Replace our sickness with your healing. Lord, replace our sadness and suspicion with your joy and your hope and your peace. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Amen.